This is Mike Roth. Welcome to the Open Forum in the Villages podcast. In this show, we're going to talk to leaders in the community, leaders of clubs, and interesting folks who live here in the villages to give perspective of what's happening here in the villages and information that I think all villagers should have. We hope to add a new episode most Friday at 9 o'clock. This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Villages. I'm here today with Mark Newhouse. Thanks for joining us, Mark. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, Mark is a writer and has been writing for about 60 years. Mark, Mark's written several novels. The one that I started to read was a three-parter called The Devil's Bookkeepers. So, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and your book, The Devil's Bookkeeper? Well, I'm very proud The Devil's Bookkeepers won the Grand Prize Fiction Series and First Prize Hemingway Wartime Series Awards in the Chanticleer International Book Awards, as well as the Gold Medal, Historical Fiction, and Book of the Year in the Florida Writers Association's Royal Palm Literary Awards. Book three won first place Historical Fiction in the Eric Hoffert Awards. I love teaching on Long Island, and that inspired my children's mysteries, Welcome to Monstrovia, and its sequels. But I'm also the founding president of Writers League of the Villages. I'm the top cat of Writers for Kids Club, and I write the Village Neighbors Magazine writing book column. Finally, I'm also the youth chairperson and a board member of the Florida Writers Association. So Mike, just like you, I keep very busy. Right, right. And as as you may know, I grew up on Long Island, but I, I never heard of a little town on Long Island called Monstrovia. You know, there is no such thing except in my wacky imagination. Ah, okay. It could have been that town uh, on the South Shore with the house with the ghosts. Actually, the portal to Monstrovia is in the famous buoy at Key West, Florida. Key West, Florida. Key West, Florida. Pretty far from Long Island. It is. But it's a secret sector of the United States where monsters live, and a lawyer by the name of Jasper Dufinch, who I modeled after Perry Mason, defends monsters in cases that teach children about law. And I love that series. That's interesting. One of my upcoming guests for uh, probably January or February, probably February, is going to be a criminal defense attorney here in the state. I'll have to listen. Yes. Just promise to, to tell us what to do if you're ever stopped by a cop. <laughs> Smile. Yeah, right. Okay. And uh, I like to include a joke in every uh, show for my Evan. Uh, Mark, why do bowling pins have such a hard life? Hmm. Because they're always on strike? Nope. They don't always strike, but they're always getting knocked down. Oh, that's bad. Well, that's I a good st- joke. I used to start all my classes with jokes like that, so I'll remember that one. Yeah, I, I taught people how to how to sell for 25 years, and what I discovered was it worked best for me was to give people 90 minutes of entertainment. Absolutely. And and chunk up the the course into five, ten, ten or even 15 minute segments, and never go longer, because people needed to relax and and have fun while they're learning. Well, when I was training teachers, the one thing I told them is the least effective way of teaching lectures. Yes, lectures where the lecturer is standing at a podium, reading the notes, or reading the words that are on the PowerPoint slides. And that's why I have over a 1,000 of my former 5th and 6th grade students with me on Facebook right now, and I've been retired more than 20 years. Mm. I think I've got a Guinness Book of World Record on that one. <laughs> I took to using magic in training salespeople and do, doing magic illusions, and that's that, that led me on the road here in the villages to be part of the magic club. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you what, I use magic tricks, but I was a klutz, so the kids knew that if I did a magic trick, watch out. Right. Well, I'm, I'm actually going to be part of the village's magic club performance. I think it's on January 27th from 9 to 2 a.m. 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. over at the Azale Rec Center. There'll be 16 or 17 of us set up at tables doing magical illusions. <laughs> that sounds like fun, but I have to disappear that day. The next day's my birthday. Oh, and where are you going to disappear to? That that boy off uh, Key West? Well, actually, it's, it's kind of a funny story because the, on uh, January 29th is the uh, Writers League Book Expo, and it's the first time since I started it about... 18 years ago that I'm going to miss it because my wife said, that's it. We're going away for my birthday, but it's a secret. Okay. That's good. So let's get down to talking about your writing. How many years have you actually been writing material? I started writing when I was about five years old. Child prodigy. Not exactly. Lonely. 
My parents were Holocaust survivors from Poland, where I lost most of my family, including my grandparents. So I had to find a substitute, someone to talk to. So I talked to paper with a pen. Okay. And what inspired you to write your book, The Devil's Bookkeepers? Well, that's kind of an interesting story. Even though my parents were Holocaust survivors, like many Holocaust survivors, they did not talk about it. In fact, I only learned this year that I was born in a displaced persons camp two years and one day after mom was freed from Auschwitz. After she died, she I found she had left me a copy of a huge book, a monster of a book, and it was called The Chronicle of the Ludge L-O-D-Z, pronounced Vudge, ghetto. I always thought the Ludge ghetto was like Anatevka and had existed for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't imagine my shock when I realized that it was established by the Nazis as a holding tank for Jews. And as I sat on the floor reading the Chronicle, which are entries that have no emotional feel to them and do not express any opinions because they were written in the same building where the Nazi administration was for the ghetto. So they could not show anything that would get them in trouble because the Nazis had a strict prohibition about this. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, I've got to share this with my children and my grandchildren. But you have to understand something, Mike. I'm a children's book writer. So I sat there on the floor and I kept thinking, I have to write this but I can't do it. It's too difficult. It's going to be very, very hard for me to do. Mm -hmm. But that book inspired me. And what happened was, in my mind, do you remember the movie 12 Angry Men? Not very much about it. I know the title. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie where 12 men are in a jury room. Well, the idea of writing about these chroniclers as if they were in a locked room and all these things are happening to them, just kept circling in my head. And I finally said, I've got to try it, even if it's only for my children and my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down on my computer, and within 30 days, I wrote about 700 pages. Well, that first book was about 350 pages or more. Well, what actually happened was, it, I was so exhausted afterwards, I felt as if the spirits of my dead relatives were writing through me. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand something. As a bullied child, you don't have much confidence. Mm -hmm. And in my situation, I had very little. So I didn't think I could write this book. I gave it to a friend of mine who is a former college professor, and he read it. And he said, Mark, this is an amazing accomplishment. You have got to publish it. But I still was not convinced. Mm -hmm. And what finally convinced me was I entered it in the Florida Writers Association Royal Palm Literary Awards, and everybody said it was going to win. Mm -hmm. It really? didn't. It didn't win. It did not win. But I've learned one thing as a writer. You have to keep trying. No matter what happens, you have to keep trying. So the nice thing about the Royal Palm Literary Awards is you get a judge's sheet that tells you what the judge thinks of the book. And one of the judges said, the book sags in the middle. Well, the book was 700 pages. Mm -hmm. Well, I read the book again, and I thought, you know, that judge is right. So I cut the book in half, added a couple more chapters, did some very careful editing, shared it with a number of people in my writing group. And when I entered it again the following year, it won first place historical fiction, mm -hmm. and then shocked me to win the top award, published book of the year. Wow. Now, what year was that book published? Uh, the first book was in 2019. The second book came out in the following year, and it won a gold medal as well. And it also won other awards. The problem was, I was so exhausted after writing these books that I wanted to stop. I thought it was a good point to stop because the story is so shocking. And I wrote it as a romance where a man desperately wants to save his young wife. Mm -hmm. And everybody said to me, Mark, what happened to the characters? What happened to the characters? Mm -hmm. So after six months, I sat down and I wrote book three, and it won the grand prize in the Eric Hoffer Book Awards, as well as other awards. So I'm very proud of it. The thing is, I'm hoping that my parents, who passed away a number of years ago, are proud that I finally came to grips with the story and am able to share it with hundreds of people. We're about to hit 500 reviews, which for an independent book is so, amazing. So this book is self-published. This book is self-published. The reason being that my son 
took over my publishing company, and I couldn't take that book away from him, even okay. though I felt that it would probably get a wider audience in the future with a, with a larger company. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that we've just finished writing a pilot script for a television series with a producer, and keep your fingers crossed, we are now looking for financing and for other producers. Mm -hmm. So you're shopping it in Hollywood or New York right now. We were just evaluating the pilot script. And what I'm working on is something brand new for me, which is a deck. And basically a deck is a instrument for selling to Hollywood. So I'm hoping that I can do a convincing job of that. Mm -hmm. Very tough people in Hollywood. I worked in LA for 15 years. You know something? I really didn't think I could do this. At my age, it's like teaching an old dog new tricks. But I taught myself how to use Final Draft, mm -hmm. and I did the pilot script with the help of this producer. And I'm hoping that this works because I would like to share this story. It's an amazing love story. I've never written anything like it. I doubt if I'll ever write anything like it again. Mm -hmm. What year did you write the first book in the series? Well, as I said, the first book was written in 2000. Uh, well, actually, it was published in 2019. It took about three years from the time I finished it until I felt it was ready to be shared because mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted to be as as well edited as I could make it. Mm -hmm. But the response I was getting, you know, Mike, if you read the reviews, the awards are wonderful, but the reviews actually fill me with tears because people write things that are just incredible about the this series. Mm -hmm. Well, the characters in the series appear to be very realistic. The situations you put them in seem realistic, and they match what an uneducated person might guess was happening at that period of time. And it's very interesting because the first people I had read the book were not Jewish, because I wanted to see whether it would have appeal outside of outside of people of the Jewish background mm -hmm. to whom the Holocaust is such a seminal event. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mother had seven brothers and sisters, and I lost my grandparents and most of my relatives. Only one brother and one sister survived. So to me, it was so important to tell this story that I really did not know until I turned 70. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what makes the story unique, Mike, is that the lessons from suffering with these people, the characters, are so timely for what's going on in the world today. Right. As and I was reading it, I got angrier and angrier about what's happening in the Ukraine. And that's exactly the way I felt about it. In fact, it was funny. I finished the first book about two weeks before the quarantine for COVID. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a totally different perspective on that quarantine than most people had. Because I thought to myself how fortunate we are to be able to live in the United States now, where we have, we have television, we had Zoom, we had food. My parents didn't have anything like that. They fought over potato peels. They, they created recipes for potato peels. In fact, at one point, the leader of the ghetto, who I must tell you about, actually prohibited them getting potato peels because there were riots. Really? Yes. Cigarettes, coffee, all non-existent. The leader of the ghetto is someone I had never heard of. His name was Romkowski. And his idea was to turn the ghetto into a manufacturing hub for the Nazi military. And he used his own police force to brutally forge the ghetto residents into this labor force. And he was hated. He is the devil in the book. The reader has to ask themselves, what would you do in his situation? What would you do in the character situations? How much would you be willing to pay to save your own life and that of you, the people you love. Right, right. It's a very difficult situation. And I've, I found it to be a very difficult book to read. If you think it was difficult to read, it was even more difficult to write. But I think it has a universal message of love and hope. And I won't tell you what happens in book three, but I will tell you that at the end of book two, if I had been born two years earlier in the ghetto, I would not be here today to share the story. And you have to remember, Mike, the Holocaust is a seminal example of what happens when hate, violence, and even irrationality are allowed to become government policy. And we see examples of that every day all over the world. So it isn't just about the Holocaust, but it's about genocide, past, present, and future. 
And that's what I think makes the book unique. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What obstacles did you face when you were writing the book? Well, one of the biggest problems was there is no more Ludge Ghetto. So how do you learn what it was really like. As a writer of fiction, I have a responsibility still to my readers to try to be as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I looked at hundreds of photographs that were taken by two men who shot their, their camera through the pocket of their coat, because if they were caught, they would be killed. Mm -hmm. And that told me so much. For example, what were the roads like? What were the streets like? Were they cobblestone? Were they mud? Were they dusty? Were they rock? By looking at the photographs, I was able to build up a understanding of what everything was like so that when I give background information, people say, Mark, were you there? Mm -hmm. I had one reviewer say, Mark, as I read your book, I felt as if I was choking with the characters in it. And that tells you about realism. So that was one of the big obstacles. The other obstacle, and this is, I think, a very important one, is I was writing historical fiction, and I didn't know how much fiction to mix in with what was real and what was not real. And some people say, well, why do you need historical fiction when there are eyewitness accounts? Well, the answer is, if you read the Chronicle of the Ludge Ghetto, which was published by Yale University Press in 1984 and never published again. You're reading basically just entries without any emotion, without any involvement. Most people won't read that. But after they read my book, it touches their heart and soul. And many have gone on to buy the actual chronicle of the ghetto and sit down and read it. Okay, okay. On a lighter note, Mark. You've written a lot of children books. Children's I love books. writing children's books. How many of those have you written? Oh, I say, well, in the Monstrovia series, there are actually six written and four published. In the Rockhound Science Mystery series, there are three books published. And we are currently working actually on a podcast based on the Monstrovia series, which is a takeoff on Perry Mason, who was my role model. And de he's defending monsters and fictional characters while teaching kids about law. And I, I love that series. I had a, a mother contact me and she wrote, now her her son wants to be a lawyer. So I said, how old's your son? And she said, seven years old. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was great. But I've got about 20, 20 to 25 books for children written and many have won awards. And they're a lot more fun than writing Holocaust books. I imagine a lot shorter. Yeah, they're shorter. But you know, when you write children's books, you have a lot of responsibility. You know, you have to think about the fact of what you can and can't say and what you can and can't do. And it's very important to keep as age appropriate as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If someone wants to get a copy of The Devil's Bookkeeper, how do they do that? Well, they're available on Amazon and Kindle, and we also have audiobooks. And the reason for that is that a presentation I was doing, someone said, you know, Mark, a lot of the survivors can't read any longer. And some of the rescuers that were in the military who saved my parents, they can't read. So even though it was a bit of an expensive proposition, we hired a very fine actor and he did an amazing job on The Devil's Bookkeepers. So all three volumes are- They're all available. available on Audible? Yes, they're all available on Audible and from Amazon. Well, that'll make it easier for me to listen to them. <laughs> I plowed my way through the first volume, but now I'll have to use some of my Audible credits to listen to volume two and three. I hope you will. Definitely. I'm always looking for good things to listen to when I'm exercising. What kind of advice do you have for other people who want to write? First of all, don't get discouraged. To me, I, I so regret, really, the times I said I can't do it, even with The Devil's Bookkeepers and now with the television script. It is so difficult to just simply say, you can do it. But that's the first thing I'm going to say. And the second thing I'm going to say is join a writing group. Join a critique group. Do not give your book to family members. Give it to someone who has experience. They can actually save you a great deal of money and time because they've had the experience already. And we have some wonderful writing groups in the villages, and you can learn about them by going to writersleagueofthevillages.com, where there is a list of all our clubs, our authors, and their books.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The children's books, they also written under your own name, or did you use a pseudonym? Actually, I've only used a pseudonym once. Uh, I had sold a paranormal romance to a international publisher, and I wasn't happy with the covers, and so I decided to use a pseudonym. Uh, that's the only time I ever did that. Uh, with me, it's very important to be proud of the books I do. And in fact, with the new podcast, that's been one of the things I've talked to about the producers, that I have to be able to put my name on it and be proud of it, which is why I tell writers, don't rush to publish. Make sure the book is worthy of your name. That's extremely good advice. If someone's listening to the podcast and they wanted to ask you a question after the sh they hear this show, how should they contact you, Mark? Probably the best way is to contact me through the publishing company, which is Newhouse creativegroup.com. If you fill out a contact form, I'll be happy to contact you. I'm always happy to help any writer in the villages or in our area. I've helped many, many writers. I run the Writers for Kids Club. I've been running that now for 15 years. We've had many writers who've gone on to publishing books and winning awards and contests. And it's my honor and pleasure to do whatever I can. Uh, I think I have a good Samaritan complex from mm -hmm. surviving what I did as a child. So. Sure. Sure. Mark, I want to thank you for being on the show today. And when you get the thing closer to a TV series, let me know. We'll, we'll bring you back on to talk a little bit more about it. It was my pleasure. Thank you so very much for having me here. I hope that you will continue reading my books and that you find that they are worthy of sharing with others. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. Remember, our next episode will air live Friday at 9 a.m., or should I say pre-recorded, but that's when it'll be released on our regular subscription. Bonus subscribers can get early access to episodes. Should you want to become a sponsor of the show, contact me at Mike Roth at rothvoice.com. If you know someone that you think should be on the show, send me an email at Mike at rothvoice.com. I want to thank everyone for listening to the show. The content of the show is copyright by Roth Voice 2022, all rights reserved.